Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you, Don. My name is Joe, and I'm an alcoholic. My, I'm excited to be here. Are you? All right, good. I'd like to read the preamble before we get started here. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. Does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and to help other alcoholics achieve sobriety. And uh, like I said, I'm, I'm excited to be here. I'm glad to see you guys here. I want to thank the committee and Ken and all the guys and gals who helped put this thing on, because without them doing all the work, we wouldn't be here. But I especially want to thank each and every one of you for being here, because this would be a lousy meeting this afternoon. It's just Charlie and I, I can tell you that. <laughs> so we need each other, and thank you for being here. I... uh I've been sober ever since I could remember. <laughs> I ran out the door there a while ago and went around, made a sharp left and went into the restroom and there's a lady tapped me on the shoulder there. And she, she said, are you Joe, Joe and Charlie? And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, do you ever get nervous at these things? I said, no, rarely do. She said, well, you're in the ladies' restroom. <laughs> so I'll settle down here in a minute, I hope. But, uh, again, thank you all for being here. I'm looking forward to a nice long weekend, and we'll have a great time. Hi, everybody. My name is Charlie Parman. I'm a very grateful recovering alcoholic. Hi. Because I'm a member of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, and by the grace of the power that I found through the 12-step program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I haven't found necessary to take a drink for 12,013 days today, one day at a time, and for this, I'm very grateful. You guys really, really look good. I leaned over to Joe a while ago, and I said, Joe, isn't this the finest-looking bunch of sick people you've seen in a long time? He said, yeah. <laughs> We're glad to be here. Sorry we couldn't be here last year. You know, we did our best to get here, but we just couldn't do it, and... So maybe we'll make up for it this year. Uh, my other friend, Joe, which many of you know, told me to be sure and tell you that he's sorry that he couldn't be here also. Uh, as has already been stated, Joe has come down with some physical illnesses, and it's almost impossible for him to travel anymore. But he's with us. He's with us in his heart, I'm sure, sure about that. He, uh, he loved to come out here to Sacramento. He loved this weekend. I'm sorry Willie can't be here. You know, I miss Willie. Uh, Willie and, and the other Joe and John and I, we've been together a long, long time. Uh, Willie, I'm sure, knowing Willie as I do, that she probably argued with that doctor yesterday up until the last moment and finally gave in it. She couldn't come out here. Willie has to be pretty sick or she'd be here. A lovely, lovely woman. Most of you know Willie. She's quite a gal. As we uh, begin to do one of these things, we always like to make the statement that we do not consider ourselves to be the gurus of the Big Book Alcoholics Anonymous. We don't consider ourselves to be experts on anything at all. We're just a bunch of old drunks met together several years ago, found we had a mutual interest in the Big Book. We studied it together for quite some time. Hopefully, we've learned a few things about it. And those few things we've learned about it, we just love to be able to share them with other people. We do not attempt to speak for AA as a whole. And you are most certainly free to agree or disagree with anything that we say throughout the entire weekend as you see fit. In fact, if you hear us saying things that can't be reconciled with what's in the big book, we suggest you just don't pay any attention to those things, and we'll try to keep it centered on the big book itself all the way through. 
Also, we are fully aware of the fact that the mind will only absorb about what the rear end will stand. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice on your schedule that some of these sessions do become quite long. And if you feel the need to get up and move around during one of these sessions, please feel free to do so. That's not going to bother us at all. If you feel the need to go outside, smoke a cigarette, get a cup of coffee, please feel free to do that. Or if you feel the need to go get rid of a cup of coffee, please feel free to do that too. There's no sense in sitting there suffering in silence. Now those of you that know us know that we, uh, we love to have a good time. We love to laugh. We love to cut up. We love to tell jokes. And from time to time, we may start right or stop right in the middle of the session, tell a little joke just to get some humor started. And if we do and it isn't funny, we'll go ahead and laugh anyhow. It'll make you feel better, make the one next to you feel better, and it'll make us feel better too. And I always like to start our big book sessions with a little story that I think is so appropriate for we alcoholics. And it's a story about a brain surgeon. And this brain surgeon had uh, found a way to transplant the human brain in its entirety. Been doing that with other organs of the body for years. He found a way to do it with the brain. And this older fellow went to him and, and said, Doctor, you think you can do me any good? He said, My brain just won't hardly work anymore. And he said, I can't remember anything. And I can't figure things out. And always getting lost. And... The doctor said, well, let's give you a good physical and see what kind of shape your body's in first. So he gave him a physical, and he said, oh, yeah, your body's in great shape. He said, I believe I could transplant a brain into your head, and everything would be just fine. The old man said, well, great. He said, what do you have to offer? The doctor said, well, let's go up in the display room, and I'll show you what we have in stock at the present time. He took him up in this room, and he said, now, in this case over here, I have the brains of an attorney and said, I could transplant this in your head, and everything would be okay. cost you $20,000. The old man said, well, do you have anything else? And he said, oh, yeah, in this case over here, I have the brains of a doctor. said, I could transplant this in your head. Everything would be great. It'll cost you $50,000. The old man said, well, do you have anything else? And he said, oh, yeah. In this case over here, I have the brains of an alcoholic. He said, I could transplant this in your head. Everything would be great. It'll cost you $100,000. And the old man said, I don't understand this deal. 20000 for an attorney's brain, 50000 for the doctor's brain, 100000 for an alcoholic brain. The doctor said, well, hell yes, man. It's brand new. It's never been used before. <laughs> I think most of us will go to the grave with at least 50,000 miles on our warranty that's never been used before, that's for sure. If we're going to talk about the big book, we need to um, look at just a little bit of the history behind it. We're not going to do much on it. Joe or John's already done a good job there. But there's a few things that we can look at regarding the history of the big book that I think will make it much easier for us to understand the book itself as we go through the book. So we want to take a few minutes with you here to go to the forward to the second edition, and that's where we're going to start. And we'll look at a little bit of the history behind the book on Roman numeral 15, the last paragraph on Roman numeral 15. Joe? There's a little formula that Bill has used over the years in all of his writings. Anytime you read anything written by Bill, he generally does the same thing over and over and over again. Keep this in mind, it might help. But first of all, he always describes what the problem is. He'll give us a solution to that problem. And then he'll give us a, pr a practical program of action to implement the solution. And Bill does that over and over and over, and he does this in the big book. The bottom of the page, uh, Roman numeral page 15, he said the spark that was to flare in the first AA group was struck in Akron, Ohio, in June 1935 doing a talk between a New York stockbroker and an Akron physician. Now, we know this New York stockbroker to be this fellow named Bill Wilson. I think we're treating Bill pretty good when we call him a New York stockbroker. He really wasn't. He was a New York City stock speculator. He made his living out of selling fast, talking to slow-thinking people. 
Don't want to take anything away from Bill. He was a great man. But we all need to recognize that he was a real alcoholic, just like all the rest of us. Bill was the primary author of the big book. And understanding his alcoholic like the rest of us will make it a little bit easier to understand the book itself. And we know the Akron physician was this fellow named Dr. Bob Smith. Six months earlier, the broker had been relieved of his drink obsession by a sudden spiritual experience following a meeting with an alcoholic friend who'd been in contact with the Oxford group of that day. A little later on, when we get into Bill's story, we're going to be able to see where Bill had a, had a visit from an old alcoholic friend, a fellow named Abby Thatcher. And Abby and Bill used to drink together. They went to school together. And during that meeting, Abby Thatcher gave to Bill what turned out to be two vital pieces of information. He said, Bill, people like you and I, who have become absolutely powerless over alcohol, if we're going to recover from that condition, we're going to have to have the aid of a power greater than human power. And he said, I've been attending meetings with a group of people called the Oxford Groupers. And they told me that if I could have a vital spiritual experience, that I would be able to overcome my powerlessness over alcohol. And he said, they also have given me a practical program of action. And they guaranteed me if I would follow that program of action, I would have the spiritual experience, and I'd overcome the powerless condition. And he said, look at me, Bill. It's been two months since I've had a drink. And this made a great impression on Bill. He knew Abby Thatcher, and he knew how Abby drank. And he knew that if Abby had been sober for two months, some power greater than Abby Thatcher had to be working in Abby's life. And what Abby really gave to Bill during that little conversation, he gave him first the solution to alcoholism, the finding of the power greater than human power, through the vital spiritual experience. He also gave him the practical program of action necessary to be able to have that spiritual experience. So two of the things that Bill had to know in order to recover from alcoholism came to him from Abby Thatcher through the Oxford groups. But it was also necessary that Bill know some other information too. Just knowing the solution and knowing the program of action was not sufficient to recover from alcoholism. See, he'd also been greatly helped by the late Dr. William B. Silkworth, a New York specialist in alcoholism, who is now counted no less than a medical saint by AA members, and whose story of the early days of our society appears in the next pages. From this doctor, the broker had learned the grave nature of alcoholism. And again, as we get into Bill's story... We're going to see where Bill was placed in the town's hospital in New York City in the summer of 1933 to be withdrawn from alcohol by Dr. Silkworth. And after Dr. Silkworth got him fairly well sobered up where he might be able to listen and hear some things, Dr. Silkworth sat down with him and gave him his ideas about this thing called alcoholism. And he said, Bill, I do not believe that alcoholism is a matter of willpower. He said, I do not believe it's a matter of moral character. And he said, I don't think sin's got anything to do with it at all. He said, I believe people like you are suffering from an illness. And he said, it's a very peculiar illness. It seems to be a twofold illness, an illness of the body as well as an illness of the mind. And he said, I believe that people like you, whenever you put any alcohol whatsoever into your system, it creates an actual physical craving that makes it virtually impossible for you to stop drinking after you have once started. And he said, that only happens to about one person out of ten that drinks alcohol. And he said, therefore, I believe that you have become physically allergic to alcohol and you'll never be able to safely drink it again as long as you live. But he also said, Bill, I believe that's only half of your problem. He said, I think also people like you have developed what we call an obsession of the mind. And he said, an obsession of the mind is an idea that is so strong 
that it overcomes all ideas to the contrary. He said an obsession of the mind is an idea that is so strong that it can make you believe something that is not true. And he said it really doesn't make any difference how badly you want to stop drinking. It really doesn't make any difference how hard you apply your willpower. From time to time, your mind is going to tell you that it's okay to drink. And believing that this time it's going to be different. This time I'm just going to have a couple of drinks. This time I'm just going to buy a half a pint. And I can't get drunk on a half a pint. Believing that lie, your mind will then give your body permission to take a drink. And you'll take the drink and you'll end up drunk and sick and in all kinds of trouble. Over and over and over again. He said you can no longer safely drink alcohol because of the body, nor can you stay sober because of the mind. And he said if you can't drink without getting drunk, and if you can't live without drinking, then you become absolutely powerless over alcohol. And for the first time in his life, Bill Wilson understood what his problem was. Because you see, he was just like all we other alcoholics. He thought it was a matter of willpower. He thought it was a matter of moral character. He thought it was a matter of sin. Why would he not? That's what everybody had told him up until that time. But when Dr. Silkworth explained to him the exact nature of his illness... For the first time, Bill understood what the problem was. Now, that was in the summer of 1933. And he said to himself, now that I know what's wrong with me, I'll never have to drink again. And we know also, within a relatively short period of time, Bill got drunk. Drank for another year. 1934, back in the town's hospital, to be withdrawn by Dr. Silkworth. This time, Dr. Silkworth pronounced him incurable. He told Bill's wife, Lois, that this guy's going to have to be locked up, or you're going to have to hire a bodyguard to go with him, or he's going to die from DTs, or he's going to go insane within a relatively short period of time. Bill overheard that little conversation, and he said he left the town's hospital, and fear sobered him up for a little bit. But we also know on our Mistress Day, 1934, his mind told him it was okay to take a drink. And Bill took a drink, and he triggered the allergy, and he couldn't stop drinking. Because you see, knowing the problem was not sufficient to solve it, it's only after Ebby came to see him. And Ebby gave him the solution to that problem, and Ebby gave him the program of action necessary to find that solution, that Bill was able to recover from alcoholism. So he had to know three things. He had to know what is the problem, what is the solution, what is the program of action, and then he could recover from alcoholism. After 1934, Abby began to take Bill to these Oxford Group meetings. And our book says, though he could not accept all the tenets of the Oxford Group, he was convinced of the need of moral inventory, confession of personalities, defects, restitution to those harmed, helpless to others, and the necessity of belief and the dependence upon God, which were the tenets of the Oxford group, which later on were expanded into the twelve steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And after Bill got sober the last time, he began to work with drunks. He liked that idea of being helpful to others. He began to go out into the bars and he'd drag them off the bar stools and take them to these Oxford group meetings. He'd sign them up out of the gutter and take them to these Oxford group meetings. Most of them didn't want to go, but he was taking them anyhow. <laughs> he liked that 12-step idea. He was helping drunks. And after about six months of this activity, he told his wife one night, he said, you know, it doesn't seem like anybody wants what I have. She said, no, it doesn't, but uh, you're staying sober doing this work, so maybe you're doing it wrong. She said, why don't you go talk to Dr. Silkworth and see what he has to say. So he went over to Dr. Silkworth and said, you know, Dr. Silkworth, I've been trying to help drunks come to these Oxford group meetings and find the solution to their life so they can stay sober, no one seems to want what I have. And he said, yeah, Bill, I've heard of some of those shenanigans you're pulling out there on the streets, dragging those people to Oxford group meetings, talking to them about the great spiritual experience that you had, and that was the only way to get sober. He said, why don't you do for them what I did for you? Why don't you talk to them about the illness of alcoholism? 
Talk about the physical allergy and the obsession of the mind. Explain them to them in great detail how it has affected you. And if they will accept that, then maybe you can talk to them about the great spiritual experience. He said, Bill, every alcoholic that I know has two questions. Number one, why can't I drink like I used to without getting drunk all the time? And number two, why can't I quit now that I want to quit? And he said, if you will explain to them the exact nature of the illness, as I explained it to you, you'll get their attention. And he said, after you get their attention, then you can talk to them about spirituality. But tell them what's wrong with them first. Prior to his journey to Akron, the broker worked hard with many alcoholics on the theory that only an alcoholic could help an alcoholic. But he succeeded only in keeping sober himself. Bill was staying sober with all his work. The broker had gone to Akron on a business venture, which had collapsed, leaving him greatly in fear that he might start drinking again. He suddenly realized that in order to save himself, he must carry his message to another alcoholic. That alcoholic turned out to be the Akron physician. Bill went to New York, and he was going to engage in a a proxy fight. In Akron. In, excuse me, in Akron. And he was going to take over the, a company called the Akron Machine and Tool Company. And if he got this uh, proxy fight through, then he would end up being well off and his, he'd get his wife out of the department store and everything would be great for him financially. But we know, too, that his uh, fi- uh, proxy fight fell through and he didn't, uh, didn't achieve his success. We all know the story of Bill standing in the lobby of the Mayflower Hotel. The business deal had fallen through. Bill was standing there, low, sad, and depressed. His partners had all deserted him. Counting the money in his pocket, he didn't even have enough money to pay his hotel bill. And he happened to look off the lobby through a door into the bar. And I would assume probably the lights were low in the bar. Music was probably playing in the bar. The laughter was great and the smoke was thick. And Bill's mind said, I believe I'll go in there and be with people of my kind, and I'll feel better. But as he started through the door, for the first time, his mind said, Bill, you can't do that. If you're going to go in there, you're going to get drunk just sure as anything. In an absolute necessity, in complete desperation, Bill made a few phone calls. He remembered how back in New York City, even though he had never helped anybody else, that every time he had tried, he himself had felt better. So he thought, if I can get a hold of a drunk here in Akron to talk to him, maybe I'll feel better and maybe I won't have to drink. And I think we all need to remember that Bill called on Dr. Bob through Henrietta Cyberling, not to sober up Dr. Bob, but to keep Bill Wilson from getting drunk. Thank God it kept him from getting drunk, too. He went over and called Henrietta, and she in turn called uh, Dr. Bob's wife in and, and set up the meeting. And Henrietta sat down. She said, I've got a, an alcoholic here from New York City, and, and he thinks he may have found the answer to alcoholism. Uh, is it possible that you might bring Dr. Bob over and let them visit? And Ann said, well, I would love to. But she said, you know, this is Mother's Day, and he's brought me home, a, or the day before Mother's Day, he's brought me home a potted plant and said he's potted under the kitchen table at the present time. <laughs> But she said, I'll try to get him over there tomorrow. And the next morning, Dr. Bob got up and Ann set in on him to go over to Henrietta's and talk to this drunk from New York City. And you know, Dr. Bob was hungover and feeling bad and he didn't want to go. He said, no, I'm not going over there. And she said, well, I really think you should. She said, you know, you've been trying to do something about your alcohol problem for a long time and you haven't found the answer here, maybe this guy will have the answer to it. Dr. Bob said, I don't feel like going. And she said, well, we're going to go anyhow. No. So said, eventually no, eventually she got him to go, and he said, I'm going to go over there, and I'm going to give that guy 15 minutes of my time, and then I'm coming home. And he went over there, and Bill and Bob went off in the room by themselves. Five hours later, they came out of that room. And Dr. Bob always said, this is the first guy I ever talked to that knew what he was talking about when it came to alcoholism. Let's see what the book says. I've often thought, well, I wondered, well, how, how come it was so easy that Henry ever silently agreed to meet with Bill and to set up this meeting with Bob? Well, Bill, uh, Bob had been going to the Oxford group meetings, 
And about three or four months prior to this, they had prayed that night at the Oxford Group meeting that Dr. Bob might find a solution for his alcoholism. And here comes Bill with a solution. And they've been, they, they thought that was an answer to their prayer. And this physician had repeatedly tried spiritual means to resolve his alcoholic dilemma, but had failed. You know, Bill was surprised to find out that Dr. Bob was in the Oxford groups. Dr. Bob knew about the need for the spiritual experience. He knew the practical program of action, but he had never been able to apply it to the depth necessary to recover. As you see, he didn't know what was wrong with him. But when the broker gave him Dr. Silkworth's description of alcoholism and his hopelessness, the physician began to pursue the spiritual remedy for his malady with a willingness he had never before been able to muster. He sobered never to drink again up to the moment of his death in 1950. And I always wondered how this old conan manipulating New York City stock speculator alcoholic would be able to sit down with a well-trained surgeon and explain to that surgeon what was wrong with his mind and what was wrong with his body. Bill did something here that he had never done before. He remembered what Dr. Silkworth had told him to do. He explained to them the exact nature of the illness, and you'll get their attention. And Bill didn't start trying to explain it coming from a medical side. He, For the first time, he said, let me tell you my story. And he sat down and began to talk with Dr. Bob and talked about his own drinking. He didn't talk about Dr. Bob's drinking at all. And he talked about the many, many, many times that he was going to stop off in a speakeasy and have a couple of drinks and then go home and have dinner with his wife, Lois. And he said, I'd have those two drinks and something would happen and I would be unable to stop drinking. And I may not get home until midnight. I may not get home till the next day or the next week. And Dr. Bob said, my God, man, that's what's been happening to me. And Bill said, well, there's a little doctor in New York City named Dr. Silkworth that explained to me that this is a physical allergy of the body. That when we put alcohol in our system, it produces a physical craving, and we're unable to stop drinking after we've once started. He also talked about the many, many times he'd sworn off. He said, I've got a tremendous amount of willpower. I've always been able to do everything I wanted to do based on willpower. But he said, when it comes to alcohol, it seemed as though I might swear off one evening and the next morning find myself sitting in a bar wondering how in the hell did I get here this time. Dr. Bob said, my God, man, <laughs> that's what's wrong with me. And Bill said, this same doctor explained to me that this is an obsession of the mind. And because of that, we're unable to keep from taking the first drink. And explain to him the powerlessness of the body and the powerlessness of the mind. And for the first time, Dr. Bob could really see his problem too. He began to apply the program of action to a depth he had never applied it before. And lo and behold, he had a spiritual experience just like Bill Wilson did. And he recovered from alcoholism. And they sitting around talking one day and and Dr. Bob said, you know, if we're going to if we're gonna keep this thing, we're going to have to start giving it away. And Bill said, what do you mean? He said, we're going to start taking it to some other alcoholics here in Akron. And Bill said, well, I don't know anybody here in Akron. Do you, an alcoholic? And Dr. Bob said, no. But he said, the head nurse down at the hospital will surely know someone. So he called up and said, have you got an alcoholic down there we can talk to? said, I've got a hell fellow from here from New York City, and we think we found a way to help people overcome alcoholism. Do you have anybody down there we can come and visit? And she said, oh, yeah. I said, we've got a corker down here. I said, he just blacked the eyes of two nurses. I said, we've got him tied down in here, strapped to, to a bed. Come on, come on down and see him. And, and she said, and by the way, Dr. Bob, uh, have you tried this on yourself? <laughs> he didn't think anybody knew he was an alcoholic, but, of course, everybody did. So they went down to see another guy named Bill Dotson, the man on the bed. We see the picture in AA rooms all over the world, Bill and Bob sitting there talking to Bill Dotson. He said, hence the two men set to work. Am I on here? Mary, the lack of power is my dilemma. You might have to get closer. I'm right into it now. 
Is that better? Can you hear back in the back? Okay. It said, hence the two men set to work almost frankly upon alcoholics arriving in the ward of the Akron City Hospital. The very first case, a desperate one, recovered immediately and became AA number three. He never had another drink. Of course, we know that to be the lawyer, Bill Dotson. And Bill and Bob went in and sat down with the, with the lawyer, Bill. And they didn't talk to Bill Dotson about Bill Dotson drinking. They talked about their drinking. They talked about their physical allergy and their deception of the mind. And he be, became AA number three and recovered immediately and never had another drink. Through the sharing of their stories, Bill Dotson was able to see his problem too. He was able to see his physical allergy. He was able to see his obsession of the mind. He was able to see the hopeless condition of the mind and body, the powerlessness resulting from alcoholism. Two days later, he said to his wife, get my clothes out of the closet, I'm going home. And he got up and he dressed and he went home and he began to apply the little program of action that they had brought to him. And lo and behold, he had a vital spiritual experience too and recovered from alcoholism. Now this makes three people in the city of Akron. All three of them know three things. What is the problem? What is the solution? What's the program of action necessary to find that solution? All three had applied the program, had the spiritual experience. Now this work at Akron continued through the summer of 1935. There were many failures, but there was an occasional heartening success. And as we go back and think about that period of time, you know, we've got to realize that these guys really didn't know much about what they were doing. Everything that they had that, been trying to do was on an experimental basis. And what worked, they would retain. What didn't work, they would discard. And they tried many, many things that, during that summer to help alcoholics. You know, one of Dr. Bob's favorite things was to fill them up with sour kraut juice mixed with honey. The sauerkraut juice had the vitamins that the body needed. The honey would make it possible to drink the damn stuff. <clears throat> they tried that amongst many things, and every once in a while one of these guys would fall over dead. I can almost see Bill turn to Bob and say, oh, shit, let's go do that again, you know. <laughs> so I think as we think about that period of time, and we give credit to Bill and Bob and, and the first 100, which we should, we also should give credit to those that they failed with, too. They probably learned more that summer from their failures than they did from their successes. And when the broker returned to New York in the fall of 1935, the first AA group had actually been formed, though no one realized it at the time. By late 1937, the number of members having substantial sobriety time behind them was sufficient to convince the membership that a new light had entered the dark world of the alcoholic. A second small group had promptly taken shape in New York, and besides there were scattered alcoholics who picked up the basic ideas in Akron or New York and were trying to form AA groups in other cities. Now remember at that time there was no AA groups as we know them. What they had was the Oxford groups, and uh, they went to the Oxford groups, and they called themselves the drunk squad of the Oxford group to separate themselves from the normal Oxford group members. In 1937... Bill was back in Aquin, again on a business venture, stopped in to visit with Dr. Bob. And they sat down in Dr. Bob's kitchen, and they counted the number of people that they knew that were staying sober on these three little pieces of information. And I think they were surprised to find there was approximately 40 people sober, some in Akron, some in New York City. When Bill went back to New York City, he began to do there what he had done with Dr. Bob, and people in New York City began to respond and got sober. A few had started to get sober up in Cleveland, and one or two others around in that particular area. And I think for the first time they began to realize, you know, maybe, just maybe, we have found the answer to this thing called, called alcoholism. And if we found the answer to this thing called alcoholism, then what are we going to do about it? You know, they could have decided, well, we'll, we'll franchise it and, and we'll sell it. And they could have decided, well, we've got enough people already, we don't need any more. <clears throat> but coming out of the Oxford groups, one of the things that they had learned is if you're going to keep it, you've got to give it away. 
So the question then becomes, how can we give it away to the greatest number of people? Now, this might be the beginning of the group conscience in AA, because Bill and Bob decided they didn't want to make that decision. It was too important. They called a meeting of the Oxford group there in Akron. Eighteen people attended the meeting, and they discussed primarily how can we get this information that we have learned about alcoholism out to the greatest number of alcoholics, period. And as we know, they decided to do three things. They decided first to build a chain of hospitals, stretching all the way across the United States, so any alcoholic anywhere would have detox available for them. And I almost bet you money Dr. Bob was going to be the head doctor, too. They decided to hire and train a group of people. They said, well, you know, just not everybody's going to be capable of carrying this information. So we need to hire and train a group of people. We might call them missionaries. And said, let them spread all the way across the United States to carry this great message of recovery. I'd also bet money that Bill Wilson was going to be the head missionary, as sure as anything. And then they said, you know, this information that we have gathered is already being changed within a two-year period of time. It's already becoming garbled. As it goes from one to another to another to another, it's being changed, and eventually it will be changed to the point where it will be of no use to anybody. They said, we need to get it down in a written form so that people in the future will have the same information available to them that we have today. And they said, besides that, books are, are good sellers. The Oxford Group people, they had written lots of spiritual books, and they were selling great. And they said, if we could write a book on alcoholism, explaining what it is and how to recover from it, it would probably become one of the world's greatest bestsellers. And then we could take the profits from the book, and we could build the hospitals and train the missionaries. Well, thank good, thank God that none of those things really came true, except they did write the book. And the book was produced in the spring of 1939, titled Alcoholics Anonymous. It was now time to struggle. Is that better? Is that any better? <clears throat> It was now time the struggling groups sought to place their message and unique experience before the world. This determination bore fruit in the spring of 1939 by the publication of this volume. The membership had then reached about 100 men and women. And after they wrote the book, they were di discussing on what they should call the book. And somebody said, well, let's call it The Way Out. And they did some research on that and found that there was 12 or 13 other titles called The Way Out, so they discarded that. Somebody said, well, let's call it Comes the Dawn. That sounds like a pretty good name for a book. Comes the dawn, and they just oops, they discussed that a while. You got the we're getting there now, All right? Here we go. And they discussed that for a while and kicked that out. Finally, somebody said, "Well, let's call it a hundred men." Now that really sounds like a good name for it, doesn't it, guys? Doesn't it sound good? A yeah, hundred men. Well, then a woman joined the group. Well, they couldn't call it a hundred men and a woman, and so they kicked that out. And uh, somebody said, well, Bill said, well, let's just call it the Bill W. Movement. <laughs> and they discussed that a couple of minutes and decided not to do that. And one night at, uh, there was a, at a meeting, and this is a, the meeting, that I, the story that I heard and read about. There's a fellow, they brought this guy from a nut house. He was sitting over in the corner, kind of drooling out of both sides of his mouth and kind of in a daze. And he said, he mumbled off uh, anonymous alcohol. Alcoholics Anonymous. And that word, that, that kind of caught on. So they said, let's call the book Alcoholics Anonymous. And so the very first Alcoholics Anonymous that the world has ever seen was a book that's called Alcoholics Anonymous. And then that book is the story of how the first hundred men and women have recovered from the illness of alcoholism. It shows us precisely how they did it. He said, then this fledgling society, this drunk squad of the Oxford group, uh, who were not too happy with the Oxford groupers, and the Oxford groupers weren't too happy with them either. Uh, it seemed like the drunk squad was sitting off in the corner telling dirty stories and smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee and 
the the Oxford group who didn't like that. So they they separated themselves and called themselves the Oxford uh, Drunk Squad of the Oxford group. He said this fledgling society, which had been nameless now, began to be called Alcoholics Anonymous from the title of its own book. So we have two Alcoholics Anonymous, don't we? We have a book entitled Alcoholics Anonymous, and then we have a fellowship. It's entitled Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, in 1939, the program in the book Alcoholics Anonymous was the same as the program in the fellowship Alcoholics Anonymous. Because the people in the fellowship <clears throat> took their knowledge about alcoholism, took their knowledge about recovery from alcoholism, put it down in a written form in the book called Alcoholics Anonymous. So the program in the book and the program in the fellowship were exactly the same in 1939. Now the book then began to go out across the country. And the first person down in Texas got a copy of this book, read it, studied it, did what it said, recovered from alcoholism, and started an AA group. First person in California got a copy of this book, read it, studied it, did what it said, and started an AA group. The first person in Illinois, the first person in Florida, the first person in Tennessee. So the great growth of the fellowship began to come from the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, after the fellowship began to grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger, the fellowship began to notice something that the first 100 didn't have. They began to notice the great power and strength in the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, where you can take large numbers of men and women that have shared a common peril, have recovered from that common peril, and it produces a lot of strength and a lot of power to help the newcomer be able to stay sober. The first 100 didn't have that. There was only 100 of them. They were scattered around just in a few groups up in the northeastern part of the country. They depended upon the spiritual experience that is found through the program in the book in order to recover and stay sober. But as the fellowship began to get bigger and bigger and bigger, then some of the members of the fellowship began to question the need for the program in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. They began to say, do you, do you think that we really need to turn all of our will in our life over to care of God as we understand Him? Couldn't we give Him the alcohol and we'd keep the rest? Do you mean that we really have to share all of our life story with another human being? We know it, and God knows it. Why tell anybody else? Do you mean we've got to get rid of all of our character defects? Hell, how are we going to make a living if we do that? <laughs> you mean we've got to make amends to all those people we've harmed when some of them don't even know we've harmed them? And they begin to say, well... Well, maybe we don't need to do all that. Maybe we can treat it like a cafeteria. And maybe we can take some and we can leave some. Take what we need and leave what we don't want and everything would be okay. And along about 1970, the great advent of the treatment centers came in. Now, please, please don't get us wrong. We have nothing against treatment centers at all. They serve a useful purpose. But in order for a treatment center to really be able to help somebody even better than Alcoholics Anonymous can, then they need to practice some stuff other than Alcoholics Anonymous. And people begin to go through treatment centers and through their various different programs, which vary with various different treatment centers. And then those people begin to come to Alcoholics Anonymous. And they begin to bring a terminology into AA that we had never heard before. That wasn't AA, inform AA information. You know, they began to talk about the uh, dysfunctional family. Uh, they began to talk about meaningful relationships. Uh, they began to talk about dual addiction. They began to talk about poly addiction. They began to talk about dysfunctional sex. They began to talk about a lot of stuff that's not in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And slowly, 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 
we begin to see the program in Alcoholics Anonymous changing from the program in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's gotten to the point to where sometimes today you go into an AA meeting and if they didn't read the preamble before the meeting, you wouldn't know what kind of meeting they're in because they talk about everything except alcoholism and recovery from alcoholism. Now, we, we, we call those group depression meetings. Uh, you go in there feeling pretty good. And hell, halfway through the damn meeting, you might as well just blow your brains out. There's no sense in living at all. So, so the program we're going to talk about this weekend is not the program in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. We're going to talk about the program in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, I think if I think if our fellowship could get their program back the same as the program in a book, we might be able to help a lot more people than we're helping today. At least that's what we're trying to do, Joe. Years ago, I called. Yeah. <laughs> Years ago, I called my sponsor, Franklin Williams. I said, Franklin, my program is not working. He said, well, tell me about your program. And I did. I told him I'm mad at my wife, and I'm mad at the people I work with, and I'm pretty mad at a lot of people in AM. just generally mad everywhere. He said, well, Joe, your program's working, working the way it's supposed to. He said, have you ever tried working the program? There's a little difference between my program and the program. You know, later on, I was to read in a little pamphlet, which I normally have, and I gave it to somebody some time ago. It's called Problems Other Than Alcohol. And I think every AA member ought to have one and ought to read one. It tells us a lot of things about problems other than alcohol. But on page three of that little pamphlet, it says this. It says, sobriety, through the practice and teaching of the 12 steps, is the sole purpose of an AA group. And Bill Wilson wrote that. I didn't. He did. And the sobriety, through the practice and teaching of the 12 steps, is the sole purpose of an AA group. That's the only reason to have an AA group. And we ask you today, is your group practicing and teaching of the 12 steps? And on Roman numeral page 20, it tells us some of the successes they had when the people in the fellowship was practicing the program that was in the book. And it says, while the internal difficulties of our adolescent period were being ironed out, public acceptance of AA grew by leaps and bounds. For this, there were two principal reasons the large number of recoveries, and reunited homes. Now, these made their impressions everywhere. Of, al of alcoholics who came to AA and really tried, 50% got sober at once and remained that way. 25% sobered up after some relapses. Among the remainder, those who stayed on with AA showed improvement. Other thousands came to a few AA meetings and at first decided they didn't want the program. But great numbers of these, about two out of three, began to return as time passed. If my math is correct, that's 75% of those people who come to AA and really try to get sober. And I know in my area, I don't know about in your area, but we can't even fantasize about 75%. Can't even think about 50%. Can't even think about 25%. I think maybe 5%, maybe or less. And I think the reason for that is because the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous in our area got away from the book Alcoholics Anonymous and began to do other things other than, than teach so, so 12 steps. And we see this happening all over the country. People are going back to the big book. We're looking for solutions today. People in AA are looking for solutions. They're sick and tired of being sick and tired in the fellowship. They're sick and tired about talking about things other than alcoholism in the fellowship. In the fellowship, a lot of people come and a lot of people go. But I think that the message which can interest and hold these people comes from a book called Alcoholics Anonymous. At least that did for me. A lot of the old-timers in AA <clears throat> tend to blame this problem on treatment centers and new people. They say, well, those new people, they come in here and they want to talk about everything except alcoholism and recovery they're from. And we just can't identify with them. Their language is different than ours, and we can't identify with them, so we're just going to stay home. And when the old-timer does that, I think we have abdicated our responsibility for AA. We've turned it over to the sickest of the sickest, who are the newcomers. And then we stand back and say, look what they're doing to RAA. No, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a treatment center problem. I don't think it's a newcomer problem. I think it's an old-timer problem. There's not enough old-timers willing to stand up and rear back and say, look, all that stuff that you learned out there 
somewhere is probably good information, but that's not AA information. Here's AA information, and let's talk about alcoholism and alcoholism only, period. That's the only thing we got in common in AA. Let's talk about recovery from alcoholism. Let's talk about the program found in the big book Alcoholics Anonymous. If we will insist on doing that, then after a while the newcomers will start talking about it too. But if we don't do it, who's going to do it? And if nobody does it, then eventually AA is going to fall by the wayside, just like all the other fellowships in the past that have tried to do so many things other than actual recovery from alcoholism. And I really believe that's our responsibility. Now, we're not going to preach anymore. Mm-hmm. We're through preaching. That's the last preaching we'll do this weekend. I hope you don't Promise believe you. that. <laughs> <laughs> that. That is our singleness of purpose, the practice and teaching of the 12 steps. If we stick with that, we won't have any more problems. Let's go back to the, the contents now, the table of contents, because the table of contents tells us a little story. And, you know, I didn't know that when I first came into Alcoholics Anonymous. I was in the printing business all my life. I've been in the printing business. And I have published books just like this. And I didn't, uh, and I, I knew the, the nomenclature of a book. And, uh, I didn't know that this book, Alcoholics Anonymous, had any rhyme or reason to it at all. Because I figured, you know, the way I was thinking, them bunch of old drunks wrote it. So what would they know about a book? But come to find out, they know an awful lot about a book. This book is laid out in a precise, definite pattern. That we understand the way it's laid out, it will help us to study and to understand the book. For instance, uh, I know that that all books have goals. Trying to all textbooks have goals. They try to teach us something. And goal one in this textbook of Alcoholics Anonymous is a problem. They're going to tell us what the problem is, and they're going to use the doctor's opinion and Bill's story to show us what the problem is. Goal two is they're going to give us a solution to that problem. In chapter two, there is a solution. They tell us what the solution to, to problem one is, which is powerless over alcohol. Chapter three, they're going to know, like we, we know, Bill, Bill knew that we weren't going to like that, that solution any more than he did. Remember his mind snapped shut against us, Siri? Well, he knew that our mind was going to snap shut against that series also. By the way, in your handout materials, you've got a little booklet. And any time we have a picture up here on the, on the screen, it'll be in the booklet. So if you can't see it too good from the back, you can have it right there in front of you. So he knew we weren't going to like that idea more than he did, so he wrote us a little chapter three called More About Alcoholism. More about what might happen to us unless we accept the solution. And then he knew that the solution was going to have to do with spiritual matters. And he, he knew, like himself, that his mind is snapped shut against such series. He knew that our minds were going to snap shut against such series also. So he wrote a little chapter, chapter 4, called We Agnostic. Agnostic means knowledge. You put the ag in front of the, that word, it means without. Those of us who are without knowledge is what that chapter is about. It's going to give us a little bit more knowledge about We Agnostic so we can later on make a decision about that information. And the second, the third goal is the actions necessary for recovery. In chapter five, how it works. We're going to start, that's the program of recovery, chapter five, how it works. And then in chapter six, he tells us end to action. He's going to tell us what to do. Now this is not an end to thinking. It's end to action. Now, action is a magic word now called synonymous. And then chapter seven, once we have went into action and gotten the results, and then we can take this information experience that we've had and share it with another person and help them to recover in working with others. As we look at this table of contents, as we look at, as we look at the layout of the book, we can see here that it's going to present to us the same kind of information in the same sequence that Bill took it to Dr. Bob. He sat down with Dr. Bob and through the sharing of his story, he was able to show Dr. Bob his powerlessness over alcohol. Now, where did Bill get that information? He got it from Dr. Silkworth. How did Dr. Bob learn it? By Bill Wilson sharing his story with Dr. Bob. So the first thing we have in the Big Book Alcoholics Anonymous 
is what is the problem? The doctor's opinion and Bill's story will show us where we're powerless over alcohol. Well, obviously, if the problem is powerless, then the answer is going to lie within power. So from the doctor's opinion and Bill's story, we get step one. We're powerless over alcohol. Our lives have become unmanageable. To overcome that, we're going to have to have power. And we're going to find in chapter 2, 3, and 4, all the information that we need to come to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. It shows us exactly what the sanity insanity is. It tells us what that power is. And it gives us a power that we can come to terms with. And we see all the information we need for step two in chapter two, three, and four. Now, if the problem is powerless, if the answer lies within power, then we only need to know one more thing. How do you find that power? In chapter five, six, and seven, give us that practical program of action that Abby Thatcher carried to Bill Wilson in order to be able to find that spiritual experience. And we find in those chapters the last ten steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, three through twelve. So if you, if you can see where you're powerless, if you can be shown a power that we can come to terms with and live with, and if we can be shown the program of action necessary to find that power, then any of us will be able to recover from alcoholism based upon the program in the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I get amused at people today. They say, well, I'm going to a step study. And they're always talking about the 12 and 12. Now, the 12 and 12 is a great book. And the 12 and 12 contains the steps. But so does the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. Any part of the book you're reading in, from the doctor's opinion through chapter 7, you're dealing with one of the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. So as we study the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, we're in a step study meeting. And many, 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 many people recovered from alcoholism long before the 12 and 12 was written. So we know that this thing works in the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank God for the 12 and 12, because it gave us some other information to allow us to be able to work the program in the book a whole lot better than we could before it came out. But this has always been a step study book, written in exactly the same sequence that Bill and Bob and the first 100 had to know in order to recover from alcoholism. And when I first saw that in the big book, the book became a fascinating thing for me then, to be able to see how these ideas are presented in a certain sequence, how one chapter ties to the next chapter, to the next chapter, to the next chapter. Prior to this, I just read it like you'd read a novel. You know, I'd read a little bit in chapter 5, and I didn't much like that. And I'd go back and read a little bit in chapter 2, and I sure as hell didn't like that. And then I'd go read a story or two in the back of the book, and I really didn't get very much out of it. But when I begin to see that it's written in a certain sequence to bring about these certain ideas, then it became a fascinating thing. Now, it's still fascinating to me today to see how one paragraph ties to the next paragraph, to the next paragraph, to the next paragraph, to continue giving me this information so that I, too, can recover from alcoholism. I used to read this book, and I'd read a wonderful paragraph in here, and I'd look up, and he'd be gone. Anybody ever have that experience? It's called brain damage, by the way. <laughs> it wasn't there. Let's go to the preface, please, just for a moment. Second paragraph. He says, because this book has become the basic text for our society and has helped such large numbers of alcoholic men and men into recovery, there exists a sentiment against any radical changes being made in it. Therefore, the first portion of this volume describing the AA recovery program 
has been left untouched in the course of revisions made for both the second and third edition and now the fourth edition. The section called the doctor's opinion has been kept intact just as it was originally written in 1939 by the late Dr. William B. Silkworth, our society's great medical benefactor. Probably a couple of ideas here. One, <clears throat> because this book has become the basic text for our society, and I see those words and I think I'm alerted to the fact that I have a, a certain type book in front of me, uh, that I have a textbook in front of me. And there's lots of different kind of books in the world today. There's novels written on fact and novels written on fiction. There's biographies and autobiographies and concordances and God, we could name many, many types of books. But there's one kind of book that most of us remember and some of us not too fondly called a textbook. And we remember using textbooks in school. Uh, that meant we had to read, we had to study, we had to take tests and etc. And some of us aren't too, too fond of the idea of a textbook. But if you take a textbook and put it in its simplest terms, it's nothing more than a way to take information from the mind of one human being or a group of human beings, transfer it through the written word to the mind of another human being, thereby increasing the knowledge of the user of the book. And by the way, that's what teaching is too. I hear a lot of people in AA today say you can't teach. Well, I don't know why we can't. Teaching is nothing more than transference of information from one mind to another, increasing the knowledge of the one that's being taught. A textbook is usually written in a certain sequence. It usually assumes that the reader of the book knows very little about the subject matter. And it usually starts at a very simple level. Let's take a textbook on mathematics. And let's say my friend Joe here knows nothing at all about mathematics. He can't add, he can't subtract, he can't do any of those things. Oh, he can count. Uh, he could probably count to 21 if he's standing there naked and got everything where it belongs. 20 and a half, actually. <laughs> <clears throat> and I walk up to Joe and I say, Joe... This textbook on mathematics, I want you to go to chapter 5 and work the algebra problems. Now, being a good fellow, he'll go to chapter 5 and look at them, but remember, he can't even add and subtract. All he sees in chapter 5 is just a bunch of marks on paper, period. But if I say, Joe, this textbook on mathematics, the first chapter deals with the value of numbers, addition and subtraction. If you'll read it and study it and ask questions and let me help you, when you're through with chapter 1, you'll know how to add and subtract. And sure enough, he does that. And I say, okay, now that you know how to add and subtract, you can go to chapter 2, and you can learn how to multiply and divide. And sure enough, he does that. And then I say, now you can go to chapter 3, and you can learn fractions and decimals. And sure enough, he does that, gradually preparing his mind for the algebra problems in chapter 5. I think the greatest mistake being made in AA today regarding the big book. A newcomer walks in the door, we hand him the book, and we say go to chapter 5 and do what it says and you'll be okay. He goes to chapter 5 and he reads the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Step 1 said we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, our lives had become unmanageable. The newcomer said, man, I ain't powerless over nothing. They have no idea what we mean by that statement. Step two said, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Newcomer said, man, don't tell me I'm crazy. Sure, I do stupid things when I'm drunk, but when I'm sober, I'm much like a... He has no idea what we mean by that statement. Well, if you're not powerless and you're not nuts, then you don't need to be making a decision, turn your will and your life over care of something you don't understand in the first place. We present them with an impossible situation. If we can do nothing else all weekend... I hope we can see the value of the doctor's opinion in the first four chapters, how they give us the information that prepares us for chapter 5. You see, chapter 5 starts with step 3, and it's hard to start with 3 unless you got 1 and 2 behind you. Standard textbook procedure, starting in the front of the book, working our way through, gradually being taught, 
what our problem is, what our solution is, and if that's taught to us right, then we'll be ready to make the decision when we get to chapter 5. But who can make that decision without that prior knowledge, Joe? You know, most of the changes that have been made in the big book happened in the stories, by the way. And the only time that they revised those stories in the back of the book was to more accurately reflect the fellowship of today. That's what the fourth edition is all about, is to change the stories in the back of the book. The recovery section has been left untouched. It's the same today as it always has been, and there's three different reasons why that's true. You know, in 1955, they decided the stories in the back of the book no longer reflected the membership as of that time. Bottom was coming up, age was coming down, more and more women coming in the AA. So they came out with a second edition, and the only thing they did was drop some of the old stories and added in some new ones. 1976, they did exactly the same thing and came out with the third edition. Recently, they did exactly the same thing and came out with the fourth edition, changing stories in the back of the book so the newcomer can find themselves and identify with those stories in the back of the book. But the greatest miracle in Alcoholics Anonymous, I think, today is that the, the, the first 164 pages have been left untouched. In the course of all these revisions made, we didn't find it necessary to change the first 164 pages. You know how we alcoholics are. God, we love to change things. And everybody that's ever read the book has rewritten it at least twice in their mind. Collectively, though, we've never found it necessary to change the first 164 pages in the book. But why? I wonder why. Anybody know? It works. It works, doesn't it? It works just as good today as it did in 1939. I think there's three reasons behind that. Number one, alcoholics don't change. They're doing the same thing they did today that they did in 39. They get drunk. They get in car wrecks, they get in hospitals, they get in jailhouses, they get in divorce courts, they get in knife fights, they get in penitentiaries, they get in cemeteries. Alcoholics today are doing the same fun things that they did back in 1939. They haven't changed a lick. Alcohol hasn't changed. Oh, they've changed the name of it in some cases. They've changed the shape and the size of the bottles and the colors. But alcohol itself remains exactly the same. I saw some people not long ago on a cruise that Barbara and I were on, and they were drinking peach fuzz. <laughs> and I thought, what the hell is peach fuzz? But I watched them, and they got drunk off of it, just the same as I used to get drunk off of vodka, see? We saw this one guy pulling beer over ice. Beer over Light beer over ice cube. <clears throat> Human nature never changes. Human nature is the same today as it was in 1939, as it was 2,000 years ago. Well, if alcoholics haven't changed, if alcohol hasn't changed, if human nature hasn't changed, then there's no need to change the big book Alcoholics Anonymous. And I think that's a real, real miracle. One little change they did make, which is important to me. Uh, in, 19, in the first 16 printings of the big book Alcoholics Anonymous, the doctor's opinion was on page one. You can come up and check this book if you don't believe me. It's on page one. 1955 when they made the, the second edition, for some reason or other and we don't know why, they moved the doctor's opinion back into the Roman numeral sections and put Bill's story on page one. And we all skip over them Roman numeral sections, don't we? One of the most important chapters in the book is the doctor's opinion. And so I call it the first 173 pages of the book. Because the doctor's opinion is going to tell us precisely what's wrong with us, and the rest of the book is going to tell us how to recover from that condition of body and the mind. And I don't know why they did that, but it was important to me to know that the doctor's opinion was on page one at one time. Now we'll move to, uh, forward to the first edition. More information. It says we, and there's the biggest word in all of Alcoholics Anonymous, we. We can do what I cannot do. We can help me stay sober. We of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Two different things. A seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. And a little bit later on this afternoon, we're going to separate the mind from the body and the doctor's opinion 
and talk about them in great detail. And it says to show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. Now that's in italic. Charlie calls it squiggly writing. You have to watch him because he messes you up. So it's really italic. And when italic means something is important. It says precisely how we have recovered. Later on in the book, we're going to see words like specifically, exactly, with clear-cut directions on how to recover. So this is not a book on just about how to recover from alcoholism. It's going to tell us precisely, specifically, exactly, with clear-cut directions on how they recover. And if I want to recover like they did, you guess what? I need to do precisely, specifically, exactly, as best as I can, Otherwise, I may not recover from alcoholism. On this part that Joe just read, once again, I think there's a couple of ideas here. First, it says we of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women. Now, most books that I read have been authored by one person. And when I read a book that's authored by one person, if I see something in there I don't agree with, I usually say, well, who in the hell are they to think they're smarter than I am? And I just ignore it and go on. But if I do that with the big book Alcoholics Anonymous, I've got to realize that I'm not going to be arguing with one person. I'm going to be arguing with 100. The first 40 told Bill. They said, Bill, we want you to write the book. You know more about it, alcoholism than any of the rest of us. You've been sober longer than any of the rest of us at that time, about three years. And they said, we want you to write the book, but it's not to be your book, it's to be our book. And as you write those chapters, we want to see them. And we'll add to, we'll delete from, we'll change around, whatever we think is necessary. We're through with it, it'll be the collective knowledge, experience, and wisdom of all 40 of us. By 1939, that number had changed to 100. So if I'm going to argue with what the book says today, then I've got to realize I'm not arguing with one person. I'm going to be arguing with 100 people. And these 100 people that I'm going to be arguing with have recovered from the same thing that's killing me as a practicing alcoholic. And that makes it a little bit harder for me to argue with them. And also the book says to show others precisely how we have recovered Got to hear this argument all over the country about the word recovered. People say, well, you can't recover from alcoholism. And I say, well, I don't see why we can't. The book says we can. It says 100 people recovered from alcoholism. And if those 100 recovered from out, then why can't I recover from alcoholism? It says, who have recovered from a hopeless condition of mind and body. Now, before I came to AA, I lived in a hopeless condition of mind and body. I couldn't drink without getting drunk. And I couldn't stay sober. And my life had become an absolute living hell. After I came to AA and began to apply this program of action, I still can't successfully drink alcohol. But by golly, I can stay sober. I've recovered from that hopeless condition of mind and body known as alcoholism. I will always be alcoholic, but I no longer suffer from alcoholism. Thank God we can recover from that condition. If we couldn't, we'd all be in one hell of a shape. The other thing I think is so important is this squiggly writing. It says... To show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. It's kind of like making cake. Let's go to a good AA potluck meeting, and, and, and somebody's brought a strawberry cake there. And strawberry cake is my favorite. If you ever make me one, please make it strawberry. And I bite into that cake, and it's just perfect. The texture's right. The moisture content's right. The taste is right. Everything is just perfect. And I say, who made this cake? Well, you being a good cook, you'd probably say, well, I made it. And I'd say, well, would you, would you tell me how? And you say, sure, I'll be glad to. And you sit down and you write out for me a precise set of directions on how to make that cake. 
you tell me the ingredients to put in it, the quantity of the ingredients to put in it, the sequence in which to mix them together, the temperature at which to bake it, and how long to bake it. Now, I take your directions home in my kitchen. And if I follow them precisely as you've laid them out, and I make me a cake like yours, when it comes out of the oven, I can expect it to taste exactly like yours tasted. But if I take your directions in my kitchen and my keen intellectual alcoholic mind starts working, it might say, well, I don't really see the need for four eggs. You just need three in here. Now, I don't see, I think it ought to have more sugar. Instead of a cup and a half, I'm going to put two cups in it. Instead of baking it at 375, I'm going to bake it for 450. Instead of baking it for 20 minutes, I'm going to bake it for 38 minutes. When that thing comes out of the oven and cools off and I bite into it, well, sure, I'm going to be biting into a piece of cake. But I wonder how closely it would resemble your cake, which was my reason for making it in the first place. A precise, specific, clear-cut set of directions on how to recover from alcoholism. And if we follow them, then I think we can expect to get the same thing the first 100 did. We can recover from that same condition known as alcoholism. goes on to say that many do not comprehend that the alcoholic is a very sick person. And I can, I can imagine that a lot of you are the same way I was. When I come to A, I'd stand in the back of the rooms and lean up against the wall and look down at my feet. I was ashamed of what I had become. I did not like what I had become. i become everything I detested in a human being. I thought I was no good rotten SOB. Now, that is a problem, no doubt, but that wasn't my total problem. 1975, we were in a hotel room, Tony back there, and Joe and Charlie and I, and we were talking about the doctor's opinion. Or they were talking, we were listening. Charlie said, well, it's not a matter of sin. It's not a matter of willpower. It's not a matter of moral, uh, uh, moral character. He said, it's an illness. And I said, well, if it's not sin, it's not willpower, and it's not moral character, then what the hell is it? I needed to know this information. Because I have, I have believed I was a no good rotten SOB. And I'd run around AA for two years, and I didn't know what my problem was. Hadn't looked into it or read the doctor's opinion. Didn't understand it. But we talked about the doctor's opinion that night, and that's the night that I really become an alcoholic. Because I understood what my problem really was. The problem of the mind and the body. The physical allergy and the obsession of the mind. It's an illness. And on Roman numeral page 24 in the third edition, Roman numeral page 26, in the fourth edition, we're going to start to look into the illness of alcoholism. We're going to talk about the physical first, and then we're going to talk about the mental. He you know, says, as John said today, earlier today, uh, alcoholism is not anything new. The world's known about alcoholism, it seems like, forever. You can go back into the oldest, oldest writings of humankind, and you will find references to the alcoholic. You know, one of the oldest references that we have for alcoholism, you can, you can find it in the Bible, several different places. And there was a fellow who lived back in those days named Solomon. You all remember Solomon was a very learned individual. Everybody that had problems, they would come to Solomon, and Solomon would give them an answer for it. First social worker of the world is that known. Yeah, Solomon. probably was. And apparently somebody asked Solomon one time about, about the alcoholic. And he began to describe us. And he said, Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has redness of eyes? Who has wounds without cause? They that tarry long at the wine. Everybody was a wino in those days. They didn't have the hard liquors, all wine. And he said, You will be as one who lieth down in the midst of the sea. Remember how you used to go to bed at night and that old bed start moving around on you? Or sleep at, at the top, sleep at the top of a tall mass, swaying back and forth. He said, you shall say they have beaten me and I felt it not. How many times did you get up the next morning and bruises all over you and don't know how in the hell you got them? 
And he surely knew some of us men. He said, and, and thine eyes shall behold strange women. And thy heart shall utter perverse things. Yeah, like, trust me, honey. Please trust me. <laughs> but then he said to me the most meaningful thing. He said, they shall arise in the morning and seek it yet again. Almost a perfect description of alcoholism as we know it today. And this was by Solomon thousands of years ago. So alcoholism is not new. What's new is you and I are fortunate enough to live in a period of time when we have found out what alcoholism is. Everybody tried to find out what it is. That's what Benjamin Rush was doing, the signer of the Declaration of Independence that John read to you. That's what a doctor that lived 400 years ago in England, Dr. Trotter, Dr. Trotter, he, he, he felt that it was an illness of some kind, but he didn't know what caused it. And since nobody could figure out what it is, then nobody had an answer for it. And the only answer that they ever gave was complete abstinence, don't drink. And that's what you and I tried a long time, didn't we? Yeah, we tried not to drink. But we always went right back to it, right back to it, right back, because we didn't know what was wrong with us. I think the alcoholics that are alive today and those that are in AA today are the luckiest alcoholics in the world because we're the only people that know, only alcoholics that know what's wrong with us. Hell, all those other alcoholics out there that are drinking themselves to death, they don't know what's wrong with them. They think it's willpower. They think it's moral character. They think it's sin. Why shouldn't they? That's what everybody's told them. And that's what they told you and I before we came to AA. You know, thank God, in the 1930s, I think God got tired of seeing people like us die from alcoholism. I think God decided I'm going to take some people and give them some information and put things together so people can be able to recover from alcoholism and not have to die from alcoholism. And we look back at a whole series of events, coincidences, if you want to call them that, little miracles or whatever, that seem to happen in a series or in a sequence in order for you and I to know what we have today. This little fellow named Dr. Silkworth, when Silky went to medical school, he was interested in alcoholism. But Silky could see that, that, that he couldn't make a living dealing with alcoholics. You know, doctors back in the 1930s and doctors today really don't like to work with we alcoholics. And I got some good reasons for that. You know, they say, hell, they never will tell you the truth. And we sure as hell don't. They say they won't do what we tell them to do, and we sure don't. And they say, and besides that, they don't pay their damn bills, and we never do. You know? In the 1930s, it was almost impossible to make a living working with alcoholics. So Silky, even though he was interested in us in medical school, he went off into a different field, became highly successful. When the big stock market crash came in 1929, Silky, like everybody else, lost everything that they had ever had invested, period. And Silky found it necessary to find himself a job. And he was looking around for work, and he ran into this fellow named Charlie Towns. Charlie Towns was running a little little treatment center, a little hospital in New York City. Uh, the book refers to it as nationally known. I don't think it was. It wasn't that big a deal. But he had a little treatment center there treating alcoholics and cocaine addicts. And he asked Dr. Silkworth to come to work for him. He said, I need somebody that, that is interested in and seems to know a little bit about alcoholism. And Silkworth agreed to go to work for him in 1930 for about $30 a week, room and board, working with alcoholics. And from 1930 to 34, Dr. Silkworth worked with many, many, many alcoholics. And he began to develop his ideas about alcoholism from working with drunks. You know, doctors today, hell, they work with rats. Silky didn't do that. He worked with drunks. And he began, he began to, to, to see 
that there's something different in the body of alcoholics. That whenever they take a drink and put it in their system, something happens to them that doesn't happen to most people. And he began to develop this idea of the, of the craving, the actual physical craving that occurs in the body of an alcoholic. And he said because of that, every time they drink, they end up drunk. They put a drink or two in their body and they can't control the amount they're going to take after that and they end up drunk. He began to, to see this idea of the obsession of the mind. He said, now some people come in here and we sober them up and they leave here and they never drink again. But he said there's a certain percentage of them that they leave here and after a while their mind changes and it begins to tell them that it's okay to drink. And they'll take the drink and then that triggers that craving and then they end up drunk over and over and over and over until they literally die from alcoholism. Now we don't know whether Bill Wilson's the first guy he ever told that to or whether Bill Wilson's the first one that acted on that information. But he sat down with Bill Wilson and explained to him the physical allergy of the body, the physical craving that's produced in the body after we've had a couple of drinks. And he said, Bill, that's why you can't safely drink. He also explained to him the obsession of the mind. And he said, Bill, I know you've got a lot of willpower. I know you've been able to do anything you wanted to on willpower, but when it's come to alcohol, you have no willpower at all because just before you take the first drink, your mind sees nothing wrong with drinking. And if your mind doesn't see anything wrong with drinking, then willpower is gone. And he said, because of that, you've become absolutely powerless over alcohol. Now, we know that that wasn't enough to recover from alcoholism. But we know when Abby came to see Bill, Bill had that information in his mind. And he knew he was hopeless. He knew he was powerless. And Abby gave him the solution, the power, and the program of action. And then Bill recovered. Bill took that to Dr. Bob. See, Dr. Bob already knew the solution. He knew the program of action. He had been trying to recover, but he didn't know what was wrong with him. He thought it was willpower. He thought it was moral character. He thought it was sin. Why shouldn't he? That's what everybody had told him. But when Bill gave him the doctor's opinion, and Dr. Bob applied the program and recovered, they took it to Bill Dotson. Bill Dotson didn't know the problem. He didn't know the solution. He didn't know the program of action. And they sat down and explained it to him in that sequence. And lo and behold, he could see his powerlessness, the need for the power, and the program of action, and he recovered from alcohol. And thank God for that. Thank God for Dr. Silkworth. Now, I think today we're, we're beginning to forget in AA how important this doctor was to us. If it wasn't for Dr. Silkworth, we wouldn't be here today. If it wasn't for Dr. Silkworth, we'd still be out there drinking or we'd be dead already. We are the luckiest alcoholics that the world has ever seen to be living in the period of time where not only do we know what's wrong with us, we have a solution to that problem too. Let's look at the doctor's opinion for just a little bit. The group that I attend, and Mary can attest to this, that we do the doctor's opinion in a beginner's meeting. That's what we do the first hour, and then we get in the solution the second hour. And people are staying sober all over. Okay, uh, Roman numeral page 24 or 26, depending on which book you have. He said, the physician who, at our request, gave us this letter, has been kind enough to enlarge upon his views in another statement which follows. In this statement, he confirms what we who have suffered alcoholic torture must believe. Now, there's no must in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous that I'm aware of. But there's a lot of musts in this book, and here's one of them. In fact, I think there's about 73 musts, but there's one of them right here. We must believe that the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as his mind. Now, this is the first time we can find anywhere in written history a reference to the fact that the body is quite as abnormal as the mind. Everything up to this to thing dealt with the mind only, weak will, moral character, sin, and etc. But here he's saying that the body is affected also. And I think he's telling us two things. 
not only is the body involved, but he says it's quite as abnormal as the mind. And we react abnormally, both physically and mentally, to alcohol. And we'll talk about both of those reactions. The first one we'll talk about, since it is here first, is the body. The reaction of the body, the abnormal reaction. It did not satisfy us to be told that we could not control our drinking just because we were maladjusted to life, that we were in full flight from reality, or were outright mental defectives. Now, these things were true to some extent, in fact, to a considerable extent with some of us. But we're sure that our bodies were sickened as well. In our belief, any picture of the alcoholic which leaves out this physical factor is incomplete. We need to know this. We must know this. The doctor's theory that we have an allergy to alcohol interests us. As layman, our opinions to its soundness may, of course, mean little. But as ex-problem drinkers, we can say that his explanation makes good sense. It explains many things for which we cannot otherwise account. Now, if the purpose of a textbook is to transfer information from the mind of one human being or a group of human beings through the written word to the mind of another human being, increasing the knowledge of the user of the book. And I think that's what they're for. And it stands to reason the transference of that information is going to be based upon the understanding of the words that are used in the book. If the writer of the book uses a certain word and has a certain understanding of it, the reader of the book reads that word and has a different understanding of it, then the information that comes through is garbled and incomplete information. And it seems as though there's a few key words in the big book that a lot of us have had difficulty with in the past. And I think the first one is this word allergy. You know, most of us come to AA, we assume that we know what an allergy is. I know that I did. And I knew that if you were allergic to something and you got around it, or you ate it, or you drank it, there would be some physical indicator or physical manifestation of that allergy that you could see. For instance, if you're allergic to strawberries and you eat them, you'll break out in a rash, the rash being the physical manifestation of that allergy. If you're allergic to milk and you drink it, you'll usually have a bad case of dysentery, the dysentery being the manifestation of that allergy. If you're allergic to certain plants, such as ragweeds, you get around them, your eyes itch, your nose itch, they water, you begin to sneeze. The itchy, watery eyes, the sneezing, those are the physical manifestations of that allergy. So I knew if you were allergic to something, there had to be something there that you could see. I come to AA and they said, Charlie, you're allergic to alcohol. You'll never be able to safely drink it again. And I said, well, how in the hell can I be allergic to alcohol? I'm drinking a quart a day. And how can you drink that much of something you're allergic to? And I said, besides that, when I drink alcohol, I don't break out in a rash. I don't have a bad case of dysentery. Uh, once in a while it would, depending on what I was drinking, but I usually didn't. Nor did it make my eyes, nose itch, water, and cause me to sneeze. And I said, I don't understand what you're talking about. You need to explain that to me. And they said, well, you don't need to understand it. All you need to know is you can't drink it. Well, today I think I know why they told me that. I don't think they understood it a bit better than I did. And I went to person after person after person after person trying to get somebody to explain to me this damned allergy to alcohol. And the answer was always, what the hell difference does it make? Just don't drink and you'll be all right. Oh, don't worry about that damned allergy. Everything will be okay. Now, if you've got a keen intellectual alcoholic mind like I've got, and you get a question like that dangling out here in front of you, if you don't get an answer to it, sooner or later it's going to drive you out of your mind. Finally, finally, one day, in desperation, I went to a source of information that has never failed me since that time. I went to a Webster's Dictionary, and I looked up the word allergy. And I found several definitions of that word, the same as you do for any word, depending on how you use it. But I found the one I think it fits me exactly. When it says an allergy is an abnormal reaction 
to any food, beverage, or substance of any kind an abnormal reaction. So I immediately <clears throat> begin to look back through my drinking history to see where I was abnormal when it comes to alcohol. And I was amazed to find out that, hell, I don't know what's normal and what's abnormal. The only thing I knew about drinking is the way I drank and the way those people drank who drank with me. And if they didn't drink like I did, we didn't drink together. So in order for me to see where I'm abnormal, I've got to figure out what's normal. So where do you go? You go to the normal, social, temperate, moderate drinker. And you ask them, how do you feel whenever you've had a couple of drinks? Can you explain that to me? And their answer was always similar to this. Well, I can come home from work, tired, tense, wrought up from the day's work, have a drink or two before dinner, get a com kind of a comfortable, relaxing feeling from it, go ahead and have dinner, and then I probably won't drink anymore that night. Now, I don't feel that way when I drink alcohol. I take a drink of alcohol. As it passes my lips, my lips begin to tingle immediately. It hits my teeth, and they kind of chatter up and down. Strikes my cheeks, and they kind of flutter in and out. Hits my tongue, and I can feel it begin to grow and expand and swell. And at the same time, it passes through my sinus cavities into my forehead, and I begin to get a feeling in my forehead, which is absolutely indescribably wonderful. I hadn't even swallowed the damn stuff yet. I just got it in my mouth. When I swallow it and it goes down through my esophagus, you know what happens. Yeah. Immediately my chest begins to grow and expand and get bigger and bigger and bigger. Hits my stomach and just literally explodes like a bomb. I feel it immediately racing through my arms and they get longer and longer and it hits my hands and fingers and they begin to tingle and vibrate. At the same time it's racing through my legs. Arms just racing through my legs, and they're getting longer and longer, and I'm getting taller and taller. And it hits my feet and toes, and I get a hot, intense, burning, exciting, get up and go somewhere and do something feeling. I don't understand a warm, comfortable, relaxing feeling whenever you have a drink of alcohol. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.